Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to the Book of Mormon podcast. This discussion is going to be on 3rd Nephi, chapter 28. So Jesus is finishing up his ministry among the Nephites here pretty soon, and uh, he has just told them to name the church after him. And uh, so now we're going to talk about some that the 12 get their wishes. And uh, that's an interesting concept to think about. Verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had said these words, he spake unto his disciples one by one, saying unto them, What is it that ye desire of me after that I am gone to the Father? And they all spake, save it were three, saying, We desire that after we have lived unto the age of man, that our ministry wherein thou hast called us may have an end, that we may speedily come unto thee in thy kingdom. Notice that they use the word speedily. Remember that after death, uh, because these are people that would be dying after Jesus' resurrection, that by and large, the most most people are not going to be resurrected until after uh, or until Jesus' second coming. Uh, but the, these nine Nephite disciples or apostles here are asking that they might be resurrected sooner than that. Elder McConkie said, We conclude from this that they desire to remain in paradise for but a short time after which they would come forth in immortal glory and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God to go no more out. Jesus grants their request. Blessed are ye because ye desired this thing of me, he said. Uh, verse 3, And he said unto them, Blessed are ye because ye desired this thing of me. Therefore, after that ye are seventy and two years old, ye shall come unto me in my kingdom, and with me ye shall find rest. And when he had spoken unto them, he turned himself unto the three and said unto them, what will ye that I should do unto you when I am gone unto the Father? And they sorrowed in their hearts, for they durst not speak unto him the thing which they desired. And he said unto them, Behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry, before that I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. Wilford Woodruff said, To these three Jesus gave a promise similar to that which he gave to John the Revelator, namely, that they should tarry in the flesh until he came. History informs us that the wicked tried to kill John in various ways, placing him on one occasion in a cauldron of boiling oil, but his life was preserved, and that finally, in the reign of Domitian Caesar, he was banished to the Isle of Patmos to work in the lead mines. While there, he was blessed with visions, revelations, knowledge, light, and truth, a portion of which we have recorded in what are called the Revelations of St. John. In the reign of Nerva, John was recalled and afterwards wrote his epistles. The first quorum of apostles were all put to death except John, and we are informed that he still remains on the earth, though his body has doubtless undergone some change. Three of the Nephites, chosen here by the Lord Jesus as his apostles, had the same promise that they should not taste death until Christ came, and they still remain on the earth in the flesh. Verse 7, Therefore more blessed are ye, for ye shall never taste of death. Mormon corrects this in verse 37, after he has prayed to know more about it, they will die, but will be changed in an instant to a celestial being. In other words, uh, they will be changed from their terrestrial bodies to a celestial body in a twinkling of an eye. Or as I like to call it, they'll be twinkled. But ye shall live to behold all the doings of the Father unto the children of men, even until, at, until all things shall be fulfilled according to the will of the Father, which I shall come, when I shall come in my glory with the powers of heaven. And ye shall never endure the pains of death, but, it will, but when I shall come in my glory, ye shall be changed in the twinkling, see, I told you, it's twinkled, of an eye from mortality to immortality, and then shall ye be blessed in the kingdom of my Father." Elder McConkie said, Will translated beings ever die? Note that Jesus promises the three Nephites not that they shall not die, but that they shall never taste of death and shall not endure the pains of death. Again, it is an, 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 an enigmatic declaration with a hidden meaning. There is a distinction between death as we know it and tasting of death or enduring the pains of death. As a matter of doctrine, death is universal. Every mortal thing, whether plant or animal or man, shall surely die. Jacob said, Death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator. 
there are no exceptions, not even among the translated beings. Paul said, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, the dominion of death over all is acclaimed. But the Lord says of all his saints, not that they will not die, but that those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. And they that die not in me, woe unto them, for their death is bitter. The distinction is between dying as such and tasting of death itself. Again the Lord says, He that liveth when the Lord shall come, and hath kept the faith, blessed is he. Nevertheless, it is appointed unto him to die at the age of man. Wherefore, children shall grow up until they become old. Old men shall die, but they shall not sleep in the dust, but they shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Thus, this change from mortality to immortality, though almost instantaneous, is both a death and a resurrection. Thus, translated beings do not suffer death as we normally define it, meaning the separation of body and spirit, nor do they receive a resurrection as we ordinarily describe it, meaning that the body rises from the dust and the spirit enters again into its fleshly home. But they do pass through death and are changed from mortality to immortality in the eternal sense, and they thus both die and are resurrected in the eternal sense. Thus we might add, as why Paul wrote, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. It would appear that all persons who were translated before the resurrection of Christ, Enoch and his city, Melchizedek and his city, Elijah, Moses, Alma the Younger, Nephi, and so forth, were resurrected at the time of Christ's resurrection. Persons who were translated after the time of Christ's resurrection will minister in their terrestrial state until the second advent. At that time, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, transformed instantaneously from their mortal terrestrial condition to a resurrected, fully immortal condition. That was by Millet McConkie. Bruce R. McConkie says, Millennial man will, will live in a state akin to translation. His body will be changed so that it is no longer subject to disease or death as we know it, although he will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to full immortality when he is a hundred years of age. He will, however, have children and mortal life of a millennial kind will continue. There will be those who are on probation for whom earth life is a probationary estate and who are thus working out their own salvation. Isaiah's description of life and death during the millennium seems to preserve the concept that even then, even in that blessed day when Satan is bound and righteousness overflows, even then men are free to come out in open rebellion and as sinners suffer the fate reserved for the sons of perdition. Manifestly, they being accursed would die the death with which we are familiar. Verse 9, And again, ye shall not have pain while ye shall dwell in the flesh, neither sorrow, save it be for the sins of the world. And all this will I do because of the thing which ye have desired of me. For ye have desired that ye might bring the souls of men unto me while the world shall stand. While the work of translating was progressing in Harmony, Pennsylvania, the work of the adversary was also making rapid advancement. Martin Harris had permitted the 116 pages of manuscript which the prophet had dictated to fall into the hands of evil men who sought the destruction of Joseph Smith. Plans were now made for further interference with the work of the Lord. Oliver Cowdery, the scribe, realizing this danger, wrote to his friend David Whitmer at, at Fayette, requesting him to come and take Joseph and himself to the Whitmer home. Oliver had previously corresponded with David about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and the latter's interest was very much aroused in the new subject. This message was received early in June 1829. Of this incident, David later related, I did not know what to do. I was pressed with my work. I had some 20 acres to plow, so I concluded to finish plowing and then go. I got up one morning to go to work as usual, and upon going to the field, found between five and seven acres of my ground had been plowed during the night. I did not know who did it, but it was done just as I would have done it myself, and the plow was left standing in the furrow. This account was related to elders Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith 40 years after David left the church. Of the same event, George Q. Cannon further adds that on another occasion, David found at the close of a day's har harrowing, he had accomplished more in a few hours than he had actually been able to do in two or three days. At a later day, he discovered upon going to the field to spread some plaster, which had previously been placed in heaps preparatory to scattering, that the work had already been done just as he would have done it himself. He inquired of his sister, who lived near the field, whether she had noticed anyone working there the day before. 
She replied that she had seen three men at work, but supposing that he had employed them, said nothing about it, though she observed that they labored with unusual skill and rapidity. So it sounds like the three Nephites were helping David Whitmer so that he could go help the prophet in Oliver Cowdery. Verse 10, And for this cause ye shall have fullness of joy. Elder Maxwell said, The father and son desire to share even further their joy with us. Our share in such joy is wholly different from the fleeting satisfactions of the world that come from satisfaction for a season in the works of men. Even when sincere and significant, those satisfactions only last for a season. For he who has known full and true joy has so said, How blessed are we, therefore, to experience such gospel gladness as when meekly we come to know what Paul called the deep things of God. These transcending truths do bring us a stunning perspective, a knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. Continuing verse 10, And ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my Father, yea, your joy shall be full, even as the Father hath given me fullness of joy. And ye shall have, and ye shall be even as I am, and I am even as the Father, and the Father and I are one. And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father in me. And the Father giveth the Holy Ghost unto the children of men because of me. Bruce C. Hafen has said, Those who have not embraced the covenants of the doctrine of Christ are not entitled to this continuous and permanent healing influence in their lives. Even though at times their prayers may be answered and special blessings given to them, this is the primary difference between having the gift of the Holy Ghost and being touched temporally or temporarily by its influence for some particular purpose. That holy gift is a, is a result of the atonement. The Father giveth the Holy Ghost unto the children of men because of me, the Savior said. This gift is available to all who forsake their sins and embrace the gospel, thereby entering the gate that enables not only forgiveness, but also the blessings of belonging to Christ. Verse 12, And it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he touched every one of them with his finger, save it were the three who were to tarry, and then he departed. And behold, the heavens were opened, and they, the three, not the nine, were caught up into heaven, and saw and heard unspeakable things. Franklin D. Richards said, They wanted to tarry until Jesus came, and that they might. He took them into the heavens and endowed them with the power of translation, probably in one of Enoch's temples, and brought them back to the earth. Thus they received power to live until the coming of the Son of Man. I believe he took them to Enoch's city and gave them there their endowment there. I expect that in the city of Enoch there are temples, and when Enoch and his people come back, they will come back with their city, their temples, blessings, and powers. Verse 14, And it was forbidden them that they should, uh, that they should utter, neither was it given unto them power that they could utter the things which they saw and heard. Brigham Young said, If a person understands God and godliness, the principles of heaven, the principle of integrity, and the Lord reveals anything to that individual, no matter what, Unless he gives permission to disclose it, it is locked up in eternal silence. And when persons have proven to their messengers that, they, that their bosoms are like the lockups of eternity, then the Lord says, I can reveal anything to them, because they never will disclose it until I tell them to. So we can't receive revelations or, or hidden things of the gospel because we, we tend to tell people. And we, if we can't keep a secret, the Lord won't trust us with more. Verse 15, And whether they were in the body or out of the body, they could not tell. For it did seem unto them like a transfiguration of them, that they were changed from this body of flesh into an immortal state, that they couldn't behold the things of God. This verse can be confusing because the three Nephites were both transfigured and translated. They were transfigured when they were caught up into heaven and heard unspeakable things. And they were translated when a change was wrought upon their bodies, whereby they would re remain on the earth to bring souls to Christ. Elder Holland said, A person who is transfigured is one who is temporarily taken into a higher heavenly experience, as were Peter, James, and John, and then returned to a normal celestial status. He's talking there about the time on the Mount of Transfiguration. Translation is the process by which a mortal body in the celestial order is changed to a mortal body of the terrestrial order. The word mortal, in this sense, means a being whose body and spirit have not been permanently united by the resurrection. Richard Cowan succinctly stated, We are celestial mortals, translated beings are terrestrial mortals, while exalted resurrected beings are celestial immortals. We can learn a lot about translated beings from description of the three Nephites. One, they, like John the Revelator, will never taste of death. Two, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. 
This reaffirms that a translated being is still mortal, for the change from mortality to immortality occurs at the second coming. Three, they would experience no pain while they dwelt in the flesh. Four, translated beings have knowledge and wisdom given unto them that exceed human perspective. Five, wicked or evil men and women have no power over them. Six, they are as angels, administering to whomsoever they will. Seven, Satan can have no power over them. Eight, they were sanctified in the flesh that they were holy. Nine, they belong to a terrestrial order. Ten, they were to remain in this translated state until the judgment day of Christ, or in the words of the Savior, until I shall come in my, my glory with the powers of heaven. And that was from Clyde Williams. Um, let's see here. Joseph Smith said, Now the doctrine of translation is a power which belongs to this priesthood, there are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world. They are hid from the wise and prudent to be revealed in the last times. Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and into an eternal fullness, but this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets, and who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now it was evident that there was a better resurrection, or else God would not have revealed it unto Paul. Wherein, then, can it be said a better resurrection? This distinction is made between the doctrine of the actual resurrection and translation. Translation occur, obtains deliverance from the tortures and sufferings of the body, but their existence will prolong as to the labors and toils of the ministry before they can enter into so great an arrest and glory. Uh, back to the scriptures, verse 16. But it came to pass that they did again minister upon the face of the earth. Nevertheless, they did not minister of the things which they had heard and seen because of the commandment which was given them in heaven. And now, whether they were mortal or immortal from the day of their transfiguration, I know not. But this much I know, according to the record which hath been given, they did go forth upon the face of the land and did minister upon, unto all the people, uniting as many to the church as would believe in their preaching, baptizing them, and as many as were baptized did receive the Holy Ghost. And they were cast into prison by them who did not belong to the church, and the prisons could not hold them, for they were rent in twain. And they were cast down into the earth, but they did smite the earth with the, with the word of God, insomuch that by his power they were delivered out of the depths of the earth, and therefore they could not dig pits sufficient to hold them. And thrice were they cast into a furnace, and received no harm. And twice were they cast into a den of wild beasts, and behold, they did play with the beasts as a child with a sucking, suckling lamb, and received no harm. And it came to pass that they did go forth among all the people of Nephi and did preach the word or preach the gospel of Christ unto all people upon the face of the land. And they were converted <clears throat> unto the Lord and were united into the, unto the church of Christ. And thus the people of that generation were blessed according to the word of Jesus. And now I, Mormon, make an end of speaking concerning these things for a time. Behold, I was about to write the names of those who were never to taste of death, but the Lord forbade, therefore I write them not, for they are hid up, they are hid from the world. Remember that back a few chapters ago when they named the names of the twelve apostles, at least we know that uh, the three are among those named in that uh, verse. Uh, but behold, I have seen them, and they have ministered unto me. And behold, they will be among the Gentiles, and the Gentiles shall know them not. Joseph Fielding Smith said, It is reasonable to believe that they were engaged in this work as far as the Lord permitted them to go during those years of spiritual darkness, meaning the great, great apostasy. These are leg there are legends and stories which seem to be authentic, showing that these holy messengers were busy among the nations of the earth, and men have been entertained by them unawares. We may also well believe that these translated prophets have always been busy keeping constraint upon the acts of men and nations unbeknown to mortal man. Translated beings have not passed through death, that is, they have not had the separation of the spirit and the body. This must wait until the coming of the Savior. In the meantime, they are busy fulfilling their glorious mission in preparing the way for the elders of Israel to go forth with the message of salvation in all parts of the world. Elder John Taylor said, In a letter, while you will find another prophecy will be fulfilled, and that is the prophecy that Jesus made to the three Nephites who, having power over death, are still living upon this continent. He spoke to them of a time when they would perform a great and mighty work among the Gentiles, and that has not yet been fulfilled, but it will be. 
you will find that many districts where the elders of Israel cannot reach will be penetrated by these men who have power over death. My testimony is that these men are going abroad in the nations of the earth before the face of your sons, and they are preparing the hearts of the children of men to receive the gospel. They are administering to those who are heirs of salvation and preparing their hearts to receive the truth, just as the farmer prepares the soil to receive the seed. The Lord has promised that he would send his angels before the face of his servants, and his, his, and his does so. Verse 28, they will also be among the Jews, and the Jews shall know them not. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord seeth fit in his wisdom, that they shall minister unto all the scattered tribes of Israel, and unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, and shall bring out of them unto Jesus many souls, that their desire may be fulfilled, and also because of their convincing power of God which is in them. And they are as the angels of God, and if they shall pray unto the Father in the name of Jesus, they can show themselves unto whatsoever man it seemeth them good. They have the power to show themselves to whomsoever they desire, and the converse is true. They can keep themselves from being seen by anyone they do not want to see them. The only stipulation required of them to show themselves in that day must pray is that they must pray to the Father in the name of Jesus for that power. Mormon declares they are as the angels of God. This would seem to mean that travel and distances are of no consequence to them. We would suppose that walls and other mortal barriers are also insignificant because of their extraordinary powers and the, prof and the prophetic words of the Savior himself, which we do not yet possess. Mormon prophesied that great and marvelous works shall be wrought by them before the great and coming day of the Lord. That was by Clyde Williams. Verse 31, Therefore great and marvelous works shall be wrought by them before the great and coming day, when all people must surely stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Yea, even, the, even among the Gentiles shall there be a great and marvelous work wrought by them before that judgment day. Uh, so he's talking about the three Nephites still have a great work to perform. So they're probably doing things during our dispensation to assist with the restoration. Uh, verse 33, And if ye had all the scriptures which give an account of all the marvelous works of Christ, ye would, according to the words of Christ, know that these things must surely come. And woe be unto him that will not hearken unto the words of Jesus, and also to them whom he hath chosen and sent among them. Revelations will come through the proper channels, not through some other way. The three Nephites are not going to visit us and tell us something the prophets are already telling us. So the folklore that we have in the church of uh, somebody picking up someone and, and they said to make sure they got their food storage and then they disappeared from the back seat of the car, those things don't happen. Uh, that's not what the three Nephites do. Uh, they don't uh, do that as entertainment or for spectacular things. That's not the three Nephites doing that. That's somebody making up a story. Sorry to those of you that believe otherwise. Uh, continuing verse 34, For whoso receiveth not the words of Jesus, and the words of those whom he hath sent, receiveth not him, and therefore he will not receive them at the last day. And it would be better for them if they had not been born, for do ye suppose that ye can get rid of the justice of an offended God? who hath been trampled under feet of men, that thereby salvation might come. And now behold, as I, as I spake concerning those whom the Lord hath chosen, yea, even three who were caught up into the heavens, that I knew not whether they were cleansed from mortality to immortality. But behold, since I wrote, I have inquired of the Lord, and he hath made it manifest unto me, that there must needs be a change wrought upon their bodies, or else it needs be that they must taste of death. Elder Holland said, as noted above, these three Nephites, as part of their translation experience, were also transfigured, caught up into heaven, where they saw and heard unspeakable things, and it was forbidden them that they should utter. Neither was it given unto them power that they could utter the things which they saw and heard. This circumstance and promise was so new to Mormon, who was reading and writing it nearly 400 years after it happened, that he did not initially know whether the three were in the body or out of the body during such a heavenly experience, or whether they had moved permanently beyond mortality into immortality. So moved was Mormon by this promise and, and, and the account of their deeds that he inquired of the Lord about their state. In reply, the Lord informed him that translated beings are still mortal, but that a special change more permanent than transfiguration was wrought upon their bodies that they might not suffer pain nor suffer, save it were for the sins of the world, insomuch that Satan could have no power over them, that he could not tempt them, and they were sanctified in the flesh, that they were holy, and that the powers of the earth could not hold them. This terrestrial condition, however, was not to be their final state, for when Christ came, they were they would move from mortality to immortality in an instant, instantaneous death-like transition. 
Verse 38, therefore, that they might not taste of death, there was a change wrought upon their bodies, that they might not suffer pain nor sorrow, save it were for the sins of the world. Now this change was not equal to that which shall take place at the last day, but there was a change wrought upon them, insomuch that Satan could have no power over them, that he would not he could not tempt them, and they were sanctified in the flesh, that they were holy, and that the powers of the earth could not hold them. And in this state were they to remain until the judgment day of Christ, and at that day they were to receive a greater change, and to be received into the kingdom of the Father, to go no more out, but to dwell with God eternally in the heavens. Herobi Lee said, I have always wondered what the purpose was that there should be in the earth translated beings. I remember a few years ago, one of the brethren, J. Reuben Clark, in a general conference made a statement like this that caused quite a flurry among the brethren. He said that gospel plan he gave, and when he gave it, he said it would never be taken away again until the end of the world. It is my faith that the gospel plan has always been here, that his priesthood has always been here on the earth, and that, in it, and that it will continue to be so until the end comes. After that sermon was delivered, I walked over to the church office building with President Joseph Fielding Smith, and we were discussing this discourse. He said this, I believe that God has never for one moment of time since the creation abandoned the earth to Satan without having someone holding the priesthood to check him. To me, that was the answer as to why translated beings have been here on the earth, always among men, and will be until the coming of the Savior. So uh, that's interesting about translated beings. Um, some Maybe some of us have seen those uh, persons and just didn't know it. Anyway, I bear testimony that these things are true and say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you, see you later. Bye.